Um, we as an office worked a little bit in China before Gardens by the Bay, but uh, typically it's been competitions. So international competitions, quite a lot of our work comes through competition world. Um, and we like to do exciting and original projects, so that's typically how they arrive. Um, and it's a good way. It worked very well. Um, working in a company practicing globally, what do you think is the major difference between the Asian markets and other markets, especially for what concerns green construction and architecture? Um, at the moment, the major difference is probably that the Asian market is a little more buoyant than in the Western world. Uh, I think what has happened in the UK, certainly, is that the, the green agenda has become absolutely at the forefront of all design. So I think pretty typically every building, certainly every building we have, we have a very strong sustainable agenda that we review and check all of our projects against. I think the clients are probably more focused on that. I think the perception that green buildings have got extra value has become much more key. Uh, I think in Asia it's certainly starting um, and I think there is a perception of the value and the logic and the common sense but I don't think it's the norm whereas I believe most of our clients in the UK are pretty much determined to follow a, a, a stronger agenda and I think my other thought would be that we work very closely with all the consultants and I think to do a green building you have to be entirely involved with your full team so I think the environmental agenda, working with extremely um, enlightened environmental engineers is part of the story. So each building is a very direct response to its context, its location and its performance rather than the standard system that they've used on the previous job, if that makes sense. So I think it's a range of things. How did you achieve sustainability in your project? Can you share with us one example that you have done in Asia? Well, we've done a number of buildings in Asia. One, um, certainly in Guangzhou, is a very tall uh, combination between office and hotel, uh, the Guangzhou Financial Center. But in my personal experience, I've been working on gardens by the bay in Singapore for the last six years. Mm -hmm. And in every way, it's not a typical building. It's an extremely complicated building. To put some um, cool conservatories in the tropics is about as complicated as it gets, I think. So our personal example, again, was to think about everything from first principles to try and understand how to do it in a logical way to work very definitely with environmental engineers who are the best in the world, who understand how to make a very challenging project as green as it can be. And always to try and tell the message about how we're doing it so that there's um, a good comprehensibility of, of the systems that we're using. Nowadays, what are the benefits and the requirements to become a green architect? Um, the requirements, I think everybody should be a green architect, so I don't see it uh, any different really. I think again, probably in education terms, again I think that becomes a key component for most people now when they're education. I think uh, the benefits are that hopefully we're making more intelligent buildings that will respond to climate change and um, work better in the future. I think. Personally, it's the only way you can think about architecture. I think to disregard uh, the, the energy consumed, the water consumed, the way that people are going to live in it is, is a fundamental key part of the design. So what is your prediction about the future of green buildings? Um, I think my prediction is, well, my optimistic prediction is that it becomes in every way part of the standard story. So all buildings will look at a percentage of renewable energy, they'll look at the way that they control, they'll lessen themselves. I think um, the key is very much in responsive systems. 
I think not only do the buildings need to be contextually appropriate with, you know, relating to orientation aspects, but I think as time goes on, we'll still use a lot of energy. We need to make sure the energy comes in a sustainable way. And then we need to control it. And I think the greatest sophistication with the systems of control, you know, making sure that the lights are not on when there's nobody there, making sure that the air conditioning is actually at a sensible temperature and not a silly one, making sure that the insulation factors of all the buildings are working is all part of it, but making it um, an intelligent building that's responsive and works with the climate properly. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much.